Hello, everyone. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, and it's an honor to you know, get the, the, the moment to share, at least from my perspective, having studied um, democratic education from different perspectives, uh, to share an introduction to it for the people who are not so familiar. So just to start, this would be like a, the, the 10, 15 minutes that I will take, 10 minutes. Um, and I will try to explain the historical overview of democratic education. Uh, what are its main characteristics? Uh, what are the challenges? And just a short reflection. So let's get to it. What uh, I meant by placing this uh, beautiful uh, uh, umbrella picture is that um, I see a democratic education as an umbrella, umbrella concept. And there are no two democratic schools that uh, act, behave exactly the same. This depends a lot on, on the characteristics of the community. Uh, and therefore there are different vari variations, different approaches to it. So the first stage that we can trace is in the 1920s, the progressive movement. As you can see, it was everywhere. I'm not going to start you know, explaining each one of them, but they are beautiful examples. Harriet Finlay Johnson uh, organizing a school based on theater and drama and the kids making decisions on it. Obviously, Summerhill, the whole uh, new school, Escuela Nueva. Um, and uh, and uh, then you got uh, even to, to Italy, to the Netherlands, to Poland, Janusz Korosak um, with, the, with the orphanage and the, the Children's Republic. So you get this really strong movement in the 1920s. This is the first time that people start speaking about this, natural learning. People are wired for learning. We don't need to force them, but we need to build this sense of community. And especially we need to focus on peace. How to promote a citizen, a person who is never going to take part in war. This is right after World War I and all the terrible things that happened. So there is this really strong emphasis on peace and uh, community building and natural learning. Then later on in the 60s, the people in the 20s had written their own books. They had, they had uh, left the testimony of their uh, initiatives. Uh, and all these initiatives got to the hands of people from all around the world. This is not an European um, only movement. In the 60s, it becomes uh, global. Uh, you have schools of different kinds, uh, the schools within schools uh, in, uh, in Boston, if I'm not mistaken, Larry. Um, the Tamariki school in New Zealand with uh, native Aboriginal populations and also uh, uh, white uh, uh, participants. Uh, you have the Woodmead school in South Africa also integrating children from different racial backgrounds. Um, and then you start getting uh, uh, these kind of approaches to education, which are very different. This has to do with anti-authoritarianism. Uh, I, I wrote educate with the anarchist uh, perspective, not because anarchism, as, as we understand it as disorder, chaos, but rather anarchism as so self-regulation, the need for collective decision-making. So there is a strong um, uh, emphasis on anti-authoritarianism, non-directive pedagogy, let the learner find their own ways to, um, to learn about the things that they're interested in. Interested in. The unschooling movement um, developed and got lots of force. Um, and there is still this, this feeling of, um, of community, which is really important, making decisions together, getting to agreements together, um, and the obvious aspect of freedom, the person being born to be free and uh, fighting against these institutional barriers and, and chains. Then in the 1990s, we got already like a truly globalized movement. There are around 300 democratic schools worldwide, at least three democratic universities of, of uh, an umbrella concept. There are free schools, democratic schools, agile learning centers, liberated learners, schools within schools. And this is happening in, in over 35 countries. We have already uh, regional organizations which are very active, UDEC, APDEC, IRO, which is happening um, next week. Uh, by the way, everybody's invited. And uh, people are getting together. They are building on these uh, networks. And it, that is exactly one of, one of the uh, aspects that I would like to 
point out. On the one hand, we are changing the educational paradigm. And the idea that was shared by Ken Robinson is becoming a reality for many and many more families and, and children. We are also moving from the pyramid to the network, as uh, Jakob Hetch uh, um, uh, suggested in his book um, some years ago. We are moving from below to the top. Uh, this means that we are building this counter-educational publics, people who want a different possibility for their children. Um, and they are ready to, uh, even in some countries, go against the law and uh, build their own learning environments based on uh, respect, on lifelong learning, based on uh, decision-making. Um, this is a really interesting point, which I see at this moment uh, in democratic education. There is this idea of lifelong learning, but also reconstructivism, meaning how can we support young people, but also families, to start considering actively uh, how they can build on capacities, capabilities to deal with the challenges that we have nowadays in the world. Climate change, uh, refugee crisis, uh, even the pandemic, let's say, but especially mental health, for instance. So this is really interesting how we are having, we are going beyond the local um, alternative, the local solution, and we are starting to think on how to uh, equip, help young people uh, develop those tools, those skills to um, effectively deal with the uh, challenges that we are dealing with. And definitely, uh, Derry is um, uh, a reference in this matter. Um, sorry, I got there a message. Um, learning democracy while living democracy, right? Uh, I always, Derry, you might forgive me, I always borrow your um, a quote that um, um, learning about democracy at school is like uh, checking a travel brochure while in jail. And this is really important. We need to jump from the rhetorics to the actual happening of, of uh, making decisions together, of uh, participating in a conflict resolution, of respecting the learners' um, uh, uh, references, interests, and, and strengthen them, support them actively. So uh, I think I lost here. No, no. I will briefly mention uh, in, in Eudex uh, webpage, uh, there are two characteristics. I would like to include two more into what democratic education is all about. First one, self-directed learning. The learner needs to participate actively in their learning and needs to control it as well. We are talking about article 12, if I'm not mistaken, please. Uh, correct me, of uh, the Child Convention, uh, the Convention of, of Children's Rights, uh, that speaks about the need for young people to be involved in the decisions that uh, concern them and affect them. And this is, I would say, one of the most important is how do they learn? What do they learn? With whom do they learn? When do they learn? We need to start building on the abilities to assume responsibilities, but at the same time, to be creative, innovative, uh, curious, to uh, develop those interests. So the first one is we are all about self-democratic, uh, sorry, uh, self-directed learning. The second uh, characteristic uh, would be um, shared decision making. How we stop speaking about leaders, and this is something that I have a that I have noticed in in several educational. Uh, initiative, initiatives around the world, how to build on, on, on uh, singular leaderships, but rather we start speaking about distributed leadership, how we each one of us uh, has a voice, has a vote, um, and can express their opinions, can participate actively in making decisions, and especially making the learning environment their own that people feel that what they have to offer to that learning environment is valuable, is important, and is appreciated. Uh, then I uh, would like to add or to suggest adding one characteristic, which is age mixing to our definition of democratic education. This is tremendously important. Um, we could see it, all of us who are involved in, in a democratic school of any sort, we can see it on a daily basis. It's very powerful, emotional connections, development, uh, development of empathy, building these bridges, scaffolding, as Vygotsky uh, call it, um, 
also learning from each other, learning, you know, from the example of all their kids, but also learning from the creativity that young, younger people have, um, uh, younger students, smaller kids, you know, who can share with older kids. Uh, this is uh, very important, and I would say that no democratic school can be truly democratic when we are separating kids according to their age. So age mixing, very positive effects, especially on building the school culture, the community, the sense of community. And then we have pre-play, of course, as, as an uh, evolutionary learning uh, mechanism, um, how they start learning about themselves, start learning about the boundaries, uh, in social relationships, that develop creativity, develop initiative, imagination. Uh, when they feel um, healthy emotionally, when they have developed all these creative skills, then they jump immediately into any academic learning of any sort that is of their interest. So uh, free play, I believe it's a very important uh, characteristic. Now, allow me to be a bit, um, not critical, but um, critical thinker. What are our challenges? Again, it depends on the place, right? The umbrella concept means that we need to consider the different localities, the locality in the global context. So I have identified at least four uh, challenges that we have at the moment. On the one hand, I feel it is really important to do more research. We have a new DEC research group, which is uh, kind of sleepy, hibernating. I would like to wake it up and start research. In my mind, one of the most important things that we need to research is the experiences to rescue the experiences and narratives of graduates of democratic schools in Europe. Um, this needs to, uh, this would provide uh, pillars for families, for other researchers from many universities to start considering the alternatives, the possibilities. As long as we don't have scientific background, what happens in democratic schools and how has these, uh, these experiences, how have they affected the kids, the young people who have been in there? Uh, we cannot claim scientifically again that there is this approach which is valid and needs to be an alternative. So I would invite anyone who is interested and actually I would start even by uh, asking um, uh, volunteers in uh, after August to um, get some responsibilities at the local level. Let's say get in uh, the contacts of the graduates of democratic schools in the Netherlands, get in um, uh, discussion groups, get in uh, you know, all this uh, information systematized and so on. The second one would be recognition and visibility. More videos like the school circles, uh, more experiences that go international, that go get to be broadcasted. Uh, so that families especially get to know about this. Even politicians have families, even they. Um, it is really important to start uh, realizing, to start showing that uh, different uh, people learn in different ways, that there um, are possibilities. I have, um, when I, whenever I speak in public, I, all, I always say that the goal is not to make this compulsory democratic education. It might not suit to some families or to some uh, learners, but at least that it becomes an alternative. And for that, they need to know who we are and what we are doing. Then this was a case that happened. This was a uh, um, discussion group that happened in France, if I'm not mistaken, in 2017. The question was, I think it was Fox, uh, who uh, asked, uh, why is democratic education so private, so white, and so middle class? So this is a, a real challenge. How do we make it uh, public, how do we make it uh, interracial and how do we make it available to different classes? And I believe that this has to do with inclusion. We need to start collaborating more with the public sector. We need to get into a dialogue um, with evidence, um, uh, with uh, uh, people belonging to universities, belonging to educational institutions and start finding the ways to uh, influence and to create different alternative spaces where kids can start controlling their learning, living emotionally healthily, um, and participate in decision-making as, as we were mentioning earlier. I just leave you with this reflection. We need to keep in mind education and schooling, they are not the same thing. They are two different things. 
uh, teaching and learning, uh, there are two different things. We need to be focusing more on the learning uh, rather than the teaching, the curriculum, the timetable. And finally, we need to um, start considering the role of adults as um, company, accompanying young people. I like very much the word in Spanish, acompañantes, those who go with the kids, those who walk with the kids. Uh, instead of um, directing and leading the ways to learn, rather to do it together with them. I thank you very much. Uh, if you have any question, please uh, write to me and uh, let's uh, get the, the discussion started. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. There's already a question in the chat. Oh my. Uh, can you say who are, what are yes. the three democratic- Scotland or England? I, I would say Ireland, but okay. <laughs> what uh, no, no, the three no, no. democratic universities? At least that I know there is a Shule, Shure in Japan. There is uh, one which just started in Latin America. The idea is the Latin American University, and there are different approaches. And the third one, I um, there was there was an initiative in Russia, if I'm not mistaken, but, but I it, I cannot get the the word the the, the name right now. Derry, are you more familiar to it, perhaps? Um, yes, but the, the name's gone completely. I suppose you would say that the work that Friar Ecrohan is trying to do in King's College London University right now is moving in that direction, but you couldn't call it a democratic university. A democratic course within a university, and there are quite a few of those around the world, they come and go. Nice. Thanks. Ian Cunningham ran a course at Middlesex University for a while um, where the students really created their own course. Um, and there, one hears of things like that, but as I say, they come and go. There is a proposal to study in the narratives of self-directed uh, education graduates, focus on their math development. I think it would be great to collaborate. So. I hope I didn't extend too much. Um, looking forward to continuing the discussion. Well, uh, Dorian was supposed was uh, about to to come in with how UDEC is involved in this, but I just yep. want to say from um, if I may, can I have a comment? I mean, it's not our only questions, right? No, oh, come on. Because you said that they're all white and. Uh, the the students and everyone involved in democratic schools are mostly white, mostly high class, and most schools are private. All of these are true, definitely, for Europe. I'm not sure if that's the case for America for, for the US. or India. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. This was a this was a, a sorry in, the, in our conferences, you know, because we're European and I'm not, but. Um, <laughs> but uh, yes, I mean, what, what I have seen in the countries where I, that I have visited in Europe, it tends to be, it, I don't mean that they are uh, racist or exclusive or you are too dark for this school, but it's rather, um, it's rather like a, a tendency that, that is actively being challenged by many people. I have seen, uh, I, I have seen, for instance, in the School Circles documentary, there are kids from many racial, ethnic, uh, uh, religious backgrounds. That is beautiful. And we need to focus more on that. Now, the issue is that when it is um, uh, private, let's say a group of people, these counter educational publics get together and start building on this possibility, provided that they don't have the support of the state or for institutions, um, they, uh, they need to charge a certain fee. There are lots of fears in families, right? Uh, which is like, I don't want to ruin my child's life if I don't teach actively. I believe that we need to fill that, that gap of, of lack of knowledge. Uh, but on the other hand, it departs from uh, some sort of capital, which is not uh, racial, it's more about the educational, cultural uh, uh, capital, which is, which is a fact. Uh, only some people who can afford it can get to it. So I do believe that, for instance, there is in Barcelona, I, I know of a, a neighborhood 
a working class neighborhood that is working uh, on, on their own um, uh, free schools in the neighborhood. Uh, this has kids from, you know, it, 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 it's composed of kids and families from different racial and ethnic backgrounds. This needs to happen. My point is that we need to keep it in mind. How to make it possible, even in contexts when uh, people cannot afford it, how to make it possible that those families who cannot afford it can get access to it. Perhaps there is a different way of, um, of understanding the contributions, the support from the families, right? I would like to, um, for a moment, remember uh, Valerio. Valerio was somebody I met in uh, Israel, in the IDEC in Israel. He was murdered uh, around a month ago because uh, he, was, he was the director of the Democratic School of Huamachuco, but he was also an activist and he was denouncing uh, pollution, contamination from mining in his region. He was very vocal about it. He was murdered. Uh, he had created a space in which families, working class campesino families from indigenous backgrounds as well, as, as well, had access to the school and they would pay in different ways. Perhaps some, some families would bring some food to make the lunch. Perhaps some families would provide a couple of hours per week to um, make some amendments and clean and organize the, the learning space. So my point is, how can we find alternatives as uh, for uh, this possibility not to be locked or limited only about economic um, uh, capacities or abilities. I think that there are a lot of differences between, uh, I mean, between countries, because in, in a lot of European countries, uh, um, private democratic schools are, are state funded. Like, for example, I know that's for sure in Germany and uh, in the Netherlands, also one of the schools in, in the documentary in school services founded by the state. So that for, for these countries, it creates the question that if you have solved the financial difficulty, then why don't people get their, their children in the school? But in other countries, there's, there are only private democratic schools because the state doesn't fund them. And in other countries, like mine, there are no democratic schools because the government does not allow them. You know, there are, you cannot say that the one thing goes for everyone. This is, it should be like different discussions. Absolutely, it, absolutely. It wasn't, it wasn't generalizing. It was rather an issue that we need to keep in mind as something. Yes, well, definitely. Mind that. Maybe we can, and maybe uh, we, we should uh, talk about that more in maybe an open space just for sharing yeah i think that's wonderful yes i think this is one of the questions that one of the many questions that led to to the founding of your of uh, udec 12 years ago this was one of the questions what can we do so for 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 starters we had an association the european one <laughs> 